All right. So now we're going to be talking about some more complicated situations. Often you want to determine the electric field or the, um, the force or um, the potential later when we get into potential of a more, much more complicated object. So what you do then is that you determine a small amount of charge um, over part of the object um, and you will work out an equation for this small amount of charge and then you are going to integrate over the charge um, so that you um, over the over the object so that you get the whole the effect of the whole charge um, if you have a one-dimensional object you treat this as a as a line charge and you can integrate over um, over a one-dimensional integral for a two degree a two-dimensional two object so you you have a surface charge you integrate over the area of the surface. And for a three-dimensional object, you are going to integrate over the whole volume. Sometimes you can come up with clever ways of writing this small amount of charge so that the integrals are easier. Um, sometimes you can find symmetries. So here this is showing the symmetry when you have a plane charge um, so that you don't have to do the full ugly integral. Right now, you guys are still developing both the skill of doing big ugly integrals and the skill of understanding what's going to understand what you should expect for an answer. So where possible, I generally recommend that you actually both use symmetry um, and do the ugly integral. Obviously for homework problems, this is not so feasible or a good idea when you're doing an exam problem. When you're doing an exam problem, you have to get the answer quickly. And I always like to say, a good physicist is a lazy physicist. Look at the problem correctly. And if you see, if you write the problem correctly, the math is not so hard. Um, and generally, especially in undergraduate physics, we give you solvable problems. So if you're getting some really complicated equation, you're probably looking at the problem wrong. And you should, or at least in a harder way, and you should step back and look for some symmetries or some ways to simplify the problem. All right, so we will go through this example in greater detail. I'm going to set the integral up. I'm not going to do the integral. Um, that would be a much longer video. So our the magnitude of our electric field is the Coulomb constant times Q times the distance from the object squared. So what we're going to do is look, first of all, we're going we're gonna to find a small amount of charge, dq, and we're going to look at this along this x-axis. So if we look along the x-axis, a small amount of charge, dq, is going to be the total amount of charge on this rod divided by the length of the rod times a small section dx, a, a small snippet of length dx. Okay, now we need to write the length, um, and I'm going to stick with the convention in the figure. So um, the length squared is going to be z squared plus x squared. And then we need to know the direction because the electric field is um, has an angle, so it has a direction. So what we can do here is write a vector. Um, let me call it. Let me call it r hat, so it's a unit vector in the direction from whatever segment of the distance we're looking at to the point P. And r hat is going to be, here we have to be a little careful, the x component is, normally we have theta defined relative to the x-axis, but here, 
it is going to be negative sine theta. The negative sign comes because um, the if I look at a section in the positive x direction, the electric field points in the negative x direction and then it's positive in y. So negative sine theta x hat plus cosine theta y hat. And then we can write sine theta in terms of x's and z's. So that in the x hat direction and z plus that mess. And ah, I have, if I stick with the convention, I should use the convention in the figure, and that needs to be a z hat. Okay, so then I set up my integral, and the entire electric field is K, capital Q over L, times the integral from negative L to over 2 to L over 2. Here I am integrating over the entire length of the object. And then I need to have x times x hat plus z times z hat over x squared plus z squared to the five halves dx. So what I did there is plug in k dq r squared and my unit vector in the direction of the electric field. To get the actual total electric field, you then need to do these integrals. You can tell by symmetry that the x hat one, the one in the x hat direction is going to go to zero. And there's two ways you can do this. You can look at the physical situation and there is a symmetry about the z axis. So if you reflect the, um, if you reflect the system about the z-axis, you get the same system. And that means that whatever your answer is, if you reflect it about the z-axis, you have to get the same answer. That means that there can only be a z-component, because if you had an x-component, if you reflected it, you would not have the same answer. Um, another way that you can do that, that you can tell that, is that you can look at this function that you're integrating over. And I see now that I actually made a slight mistake. I dropped my negative sign. So this function that you're integrating over is odd. And what that means is that it is negative, or well, this one is negative for positive x and positive for negative x. Remember that, um, and, and it's symmetric. So um, remember, that when you integrate, you're actually calculating the area under the curve. So if you have a function which is negative um, at when x is positive and positive when x is negative, and they have the same um, they have the same shapes and different signs, the um, this area is going to be exactly canceled out by that area. So when you do the integral, it's going to go away. Um, I do think it's educational, and I will leave it as an exercise to the student, to go through the ugly math of that whole integral at least once and convince yourself that, in fact, the x hat component does go to zero. Um, that's going to give you greater confidence as well that when you do the z hat component, it is going to go to zero too. Now, this particular integral is kind of ugly and hairy. 
Um, what you guys should do, and I don't think I have mine here, I strongly recommend, ah, there it is, that you buy a, a copy of Sean's Mathematical Handbook or your favorite integral table. You will find that there are also integral tables online that you can look up for free. Fantastic resource for physics majors. Um, this integral, to do this one, you actually have to do um, a trigonometric substitution. So uh, you're going to write, well, it, it gets a little ugly and hairy, or you can look it up in a book. Um, at the beginning, when you're still developing your mathematical chops, I recommend both look it up in a book and check your answer with an integral table, time permitting. Um, the way that you get to where you can see quickly what types of um, how to do these problems is by doing a lot of them. Um, and the other thing you'll find, integral tables give you the right form, but they don't always get you quite there. So sometimes you need to do a little manipulation to get it in a form that you can use it. All right. So there's other ways. So there's, you can take any object and you can always integrate over it if you want to look at the electric field from um, from some type of object that's extended. A good physicist is a lazy physicist. So what you want to do is you want to look for symmetries in the problem and try to set it up correctly. In this case, what you're doing is you're looking at the charge around a ring, um, a, a charge on a ring, and there is a radial symmetry. So the problem will be a lot easier if you do it in polar coordinates. Um, you could do it in Cartesian coordinates. It is a solvable problem, but it's ugly. And I would recommend that you do it in polar coordinates. If you have a system where the system is spherically um, symmetric, I would recommend that you do it in spherical polar coordinates. Um, this one, if we try to first figure out our small amount of unit charge um, dq, and it even, well, it gives us a certain form. This lambda, I'm not so sure I like the way that they write it because it's not as obvious what you're looking at. A small amount of charge dq is the total charge on the object divided by 2 pi r, so the circumference. circumference. Um, so this is the charge per unit length. And then a small segment of length is r d theta. So the, the length of a small segment of an arc of a circle is the radius times the, times the angle in radians. So that gives us, we can actually slightly simplify this because the R's cancel out. Here, um, uh, and we, they even, we have the distance between point P and the segment on the ring. Um, so we have our R, and then we need a unit vector. Um, this is tricky because there is a z component, and the z unit vector in z is constant, but your r hat unit vector always points um, r hat always points perpendicular to or points along the the distance to whatever point you're looking at. So when you're looking at this little segment, r hat is there, but when you look at this segment. Uh, this segment r hat is here. Um, so your r hat actually changes, and that makes it really hard to work with. So here we're actually going to dive right in, and we're going to use symmetry right away because otherwise the problem kind of becomes intractable. And we're only going to look at the z hat component. So then our small bit of electric field is k dq and then 
times our un oh, times are divided by our r squared, which is r squared plus z squared, and then the unit vector in the direction of the field, but we're going to drop the r hat component and only use the z hat component. Now, the z hat component is Let's see, I got to get sine and cosine straight. So this one is cosine phi because if the ring is small, it's going to point, if the angle is small, it's going to point further up z hat. And then when you do your integral, I'm going to just sneak the integral sign in there. You are going to integrate between 0 and 2 pi. Um, and you're integrating over theta. None of these terms depend on theta. So this one actually turns out to be re really easy. You get a your integral of from 0 to 2 pi, it's hard to write on the edge of the screen, uh, d theta is just 2 pi, so I get k q cosine phi r squared plus z squared z hat. Um, and you can um, you can write cosine theta in terms of uh, of your r and z, and you could get a more complicated expression. So you can use cosine or sorry cosine phi is z. Electric field from the ring. If you want to do an annular disk, you have two ways of setting it up. Um, and I'm not going to tell you how to do both of them, but I'm not going to walk through the math. You can either do um, what we've been doing so far, and now your small amount of Q, dQ, is equal to r or let's small r because you you can integrate over the surface so your small amount of q is um, the total charge q divided by pi r squared and then times the area of a small segment which is going to be r dr d theta. And then you would integrate over all r and r all theta. You can, again, use your, um, you have to, you have to, you can use the fact that the z component is the only one left remaining. Um, and you then would have to write the, um, you would write your angle, the magnitude of the z component in terms of, uh, of theta. And you would have to integrate over all theta, uh, over the theta for the disk. So that's one way. So you're integrating over the whole disk and starting from scratch. The other way that you can do this is that you can use the answer from this type of problem, which is also in the book, and you can look it up online, and you can integrate over the, the disk, but your, but your sections you're integrating over are little rings of charge. And that can make the problem, well, so is it easier or harder? You should get the answer both, the same answer both ways. Um, I think it's a little conceptually easier sometimes to start from scratch, but it saves you a few steps if you use a, an answer from a similar problem first. 
Um, and let's see, you can you can do something similar for plane charges, and um, you actually for an infinite plane can start with the disk answer here and integrate over the entire extent of the disk. And that would let you um, consider what happens from an infinite plane. And a capacitor, which is a positively charged plane and a negatively charged plane, um, would be two of those infinite planes sandwiched together. All right, so hopefully that gives you a little bit of background and basis for um, setting up some of the more complicated problems. When we get to the more to the later chapters, we will also we will continue to have problems where you integrate over an area, a surface, or um, a length. But then we'll we'll change what we're integrating over. Sometimes it will be um, sometimes you're calculating the electric field, sometimes you're calculating the force, sometimes you're calculating the potential. The way you set up the integrals is the same either way.